You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. Welcome back to another exciting edition of the Shoe In Show, which is the industry's favorite podcast of all time. I'm one of your hosts, Matt Priest. I'm joined by Thomas Crockett, uh, my good friend. And Thomas, one of the really critical things when you run a footwork company is figuring out the packaging. Packaging make will make or break kind of how your product is presented, how it's shipped, how that product might be returned. And all of this in the era of sustainability is critically important to kind of understand how do you make sustainable packaging? How do you how do you drive towards a more sustainable packaging initiative within your company? So I'm excited today because we have a, someone who's going to walk us through the lay of the land as it stands now. It's always changing. And so, Thomas, who do we have joining us today? Hey, we've got our good friend Mark Maxwell from Bill Rudd who is joining us to talk about obviously packaging and, and other issues. So Mark, very grateful that you are with us here today and ex- and looking forward to uh, what you're gonna share with us. Appreciate the time, appreciate the partnership with the FDRA. It's the, uh, we've been with you for a handful of years now, but uh, looking forward to the future and seeing how we can support you and uh, all the members. So what would you say, let's talk packaging, let's get right into it. What is the biggest issue right now when it comes to packaging? I think it's changed since COVID. Uh, It used to be like everyone else, it was supply, trying to get materials, uh, where things were shut down, trying to ship things. I think right now is just looking at trying to get more efficient, more effective packaging, how to promote your brand uh, in an effective way. Um, You know, we've seen as as you have publicized, the uh, footwear sales are down. So, you know, can packaging help do anything to sell that? So uh, we're working on different things with different customers right now to change and, and commonize, make streamline the whole packaging process uh, from design all the way through printing, development, production, delivery. So I think that's kind of top of mind right now. Everyone was really thinking through COVID, how do we get our shoes? You know, how do we get our product? And then, you know, the, the cost of containers. Now we're looking at that subsided you know what can we do the next step and that's how do we be more efficient and look at our dollars you know everyone's uh trying to uh, with inflation trying to trying to keep an eye on every penny is that how you you know i know you guys help companies right size packaging i've heard you and others within bill root over the years just talking about shipping air and how do you kind of limit the amount of air that you're shipping when you put uh, a pair of shoes on a container within a container and on a container ship and bring it over to the U.S.? How do you help companies right size packaging? And is are you seeing a movement within the industry on sustainability that actually uh, actually kind of helps those initiatives in the sense like if you want to use less material, that means you are right sizing. Kind of how do those two things interlock with each other? Yeah, they're, they're completely lockstep. Um, to try to right size, you're taking the air out of the boxes. And what we do is we'll do a full analysis at the distribution centers and open up boxes, different sizes. And then from there, work with the customer to figure out how many uh, the volumes by SKU, by size, and develop a what we call a carton suite. So you may you don't need a box for every shoe size. You may need two or three boxes per product run of our product line. And you can put, say, your six through tens in one, 10 through 12s in another box, and 12s and bigger in a third box. And that'll optimize it, not just per inner shoe box, but per case count and then per container. Um, In doing that, you're reducing the amount of materials. We're trying to optimize that for the inner box, the outer box, And then we just did a, uh, two years ago for one of our biggest customers, did an optimization where we didn't change the box size. We changed the flaps on the inside, which saved over a million and a half square meters of corrugated in one year. And then that equated to hundreds of thousands of gallons of water in the, in the paper production. And then 
tons, dozens of tons of CO2 emissions were reduced in the paper production and then also the transit. So it's kind of a trickle down. If you reduce some mil millimeters of the box, it trickles over to your sustainability message in reducing materials, reducing CO2 and reducing water. You know, we, we've got a huge focus on sustainability. We're actually, we have every year, um, or at least we have the past couple of years, a sustainability summit out in Portland. And, and we're looking forward to seeing you there. It's, that's going to be an exciting event. It always is. You can find out more about it on our website. But I'm wondering, you know, sometimes at these events you hear talk about, oh, we need to completely change packaging. We need to get rid of packaging and just, you know, ship, ship shoes directly to consumers without that. And you hear the counter to that about how it is such a, an important aspect of the customer experience, that they expect the packaging. There's a whole aspect to that. Just wondering kind of where you come in on that. What are your thoughts on, on the role that packaging plays for consumers and thoughts about, you know, people that want to get rid of packaging? Right. It, with packaging, I, I'm kind of, you know, Jaded, I guess my my whole career is packaging. I went to school for packaging. I've been in, I, I ran a packaging group at Kmart for about ten years. So every sort of um, good sold at a Kmart or a mass merchant like a Target, I was involved with. So packaging's in my heart and DNA, and it is a, the number one communication tool that people forget about, especially in when you go to retailers that have the shoes out. You know, say it's a DSW or whatever. It's a communication tool. So it's vitally important that that communicates to the customer the quality of the brand, what the item is in the box. So there's a lot to it. Um, so if you take that away, how are you going to communicate to the customer? That's the number one thing. Number two is in shipping and transit. So where the, where the footwear is made in China, Indo, Vietnam, how is it going to get here if it's not in a box? Maybe if it's in a bag, that's going to fall all over. We've seen slides that they've taken out of boxes and just kind of put in master cases. And when they get to a DC, you open them up and it's a mass of 50 pair of slides. So it, it's really difficult to logistically to manage that too. Uh, even if you have them on hangers, you need to have some sort of packaging, you know, secondary packaging. Primary packaging is important um, to be able to put on a shelf for a customer to carry out. And if anyone, you know, a lot of people have worked in uh, in shoe stores. I worked in a shoe store in college and, you know, as being a kid, you know, stacking eight or 10 boxes high to bring them out to the floor. You can't do that. You have to have a bundle or a bag to carry them out. So I think it, in some cases it may work in some, but a, as a whole, you still need to protect the product. You need to contain the product. So packaging still is vital. Uh, you sold me. You sold me market packaging. I was on the I was on the fence, but you pushed me over the line. Um, you know, it's funny. The comedian Jim Gaffigan talks about like opening that Big Mac container. It's like a present. You open it up, right? So it's like, it's the same with footwear. It is, there's this moment as a kid going to Foot Locker when I was the sit and fit, right? And that uh -huh. that guy, the, the striper, was bringing out the stack of you know five pair of Jordans, none of which I could afford, and. <laughs> dropping it down for me to try on there's this magical moment when you open that lid and you remove the paper that just totally enhances the experience uh and so i'm i'm with you i think there's there's a critical important role that packaging plays particularly for our industry but i want to dive more into your experience because you mentioned it uh and you're you're a motor city motor city guy and you were at GM, and you did a lot of cool things at GM. How? What did you see at GM? What did, What about your experience at General Motors has informed you about how to serve the footwear industry? Has there been some? Have there been some some lessons you learned at GM that you've deployed for footwear companies? Well, it's. I think what I learned, the biggest thing I learned at GM was I worked at uh, uh, the engineering center, which there was over twenty thousand people. And just think of the majority of them are, are highly trained engineers. So everything is very, very structured. And what I've noticed in the footwear, I've been in, you know, dealing with footwear packaging for about 15, 18 years in, in different roles, not just at uh, Billaroot or Paxess, but at Smurf at Stone. Um, so it, you don't see it, it's transitioning, the, the more engineered. Everything was so done by hand. The, the process work that I learned at 
GM, I think I'm trying to transition now to some of my customers. So as far as how we're uh, the product flow or the review process or the development of the packaging, you know, trying to follow more than just throwing something up spitballs on a wall to, to be more structured. And also what we're looking at too, along with sustainability is paper making is very complex. People, a lot of people don't understand where paper comes from. You know, it's just, it's trees you cut down, you do a lot of work, but these rolls are that start the paper are enormous. There are several tons. I mean, they're, they're enormous. They're seven, eight, nine meters wide. And, um, so a lot goes into it and we get customers that want to identify each line of their shoe with a different type of shoe box. It's great to do different colors, but if, if you get into different papers, you're using a little bit of this paper, a little bit of that paper. So if you can come up and I try to do this, a common structure across a whole brand or a whole category, and then a common paper, you can make, you can emulate foils, you can emulate different things via print or uh, the structure. So if you commonize that, you're saving materials, you're using less um, non-sustainable coatings. Some people like a real soft touch. You look at like a an Apple box, any Apple product, it's soft and really nice. Some are actually a poly, polypropylene coating laminated to the paper. So once you do that, you can't separate it to recycle it. People think it's still paper, but no, you have this plastic coating on it, so you can't recycle it. So we can emulate using a water-based coating, which can be recycled, and you get the same sort of thing. So trying to commonize some things, simplify some things, but still give the customer, our customer and their customer, the same customer experience. Are there any other cost savings suggestions? I'm thinking of you know, smaller companies or people that are, you know, um, maybe they don't have the, the resources um, yet for um, for all the different thing we, issues that we talk about on this podcast every single week. There's so many different challenges. You know, packaging, as we're learning today, is, is another issue to really uh, delve into. But what are some cost savings measures within packaging? Well, some things are, you know, our, our traditional model is we'll design, develop, and produce a box for you. But you can also work with companies like ours to just design and, and optimize your structure. So for, you know, thousands of dollars, instead of, you know, getting into the manufacturing side of it, you look at that. So it, it's a much easier pill to swallow for those smaller brands if someone, if you hire a professional packaging company to do some engineering work for you. Um, and you can optimize some things that way. Also look at, like I just mentioned, if you have one, more than one product line, can they be the same box with different print? Um, you also have to optimize your planning. I think forecasting is huge. If I know the market changes, but if you can forecast to some minimum quantities, say a couple thousand per SKU, that'll really help for these small people. Um, and if you can get a couple months of packaging produced at, this, at once instead of producing every other week or once a month, the, the more that you can combine that, the better. So that's some of the low hanging fruit things that we try, you know, on smaller customers try to get to. Now, Mark, I'm, I'm in the FDRA Intel Center. And so if you're an FDRA member, you have access to this. We do a monthly commodities report. We've been we've done it for over a decade. It tracks all the different inputs that go into footwear production, packaging, the movement of shoes. And our, our data through mid-June, the most recent report, the top of it is all about pulp prices and shoe box costs. And uh, the spoiler alert is that it's costs are down globally. In fact, if you look at the U.S. production of pulp, paper, and paperboard mills fell year over year for a 10th straight month in May, mm -hmm. shrinking to the lowest May output in 48 years, which is an eye-popping kind of duration of time. Uh, so it seems like there's a global retrenching of pricing, I assume driven by demand, you know, starting to cool off, particularly in the U.S. and elsewhere. It sounds like there's actually some opportunity if you got if you got the the budget and you can do those forecasts as you talked about. It sounds like pricing is really competitive right now. Am I, is that true? Am I missing something, or is, is are there still challenges out there on pricing? You're, you're correct. Pricing is very competitive right now. Um, everything we deal with is in Asia. The as everyone had seen through COVID, prices were up and down 
exponentially, you know, every month. And we saw swings 10, 15, 20%, not like sea containers uh, where they went through the roof. But we've seen a stabilization uh, through the end of last year. We saw some retraction in the industry. And then prices have pretty much been flat and down single digits since about the first of the year. And um, our, for us, we, we look at pricing twice a year. So at the end of the year and then the middle of the year. So right now we're looking for the second half starting now, uh, July, August, September through the end of the year uh, is pretty flat. And uh, it's just, I think the, especially in the US, we've seen the e-commerce kind of slow uh, after COVID. Mm -hmm. Who knows? We haven't seen numbers after Prime Day. You know, everything jumps up after Prime Day for, yeah. for e-commerce here locally. So I'm sure, you know, the domestic packaging companies are are really jumping at that right now just because of uh, it's been a slow year, slow first half of the year. I will say going to China, the pulp prices have fallen sharply over the last five months mm -hmm. and we're at an 18 month low on right. China pulp prices. So to your point, there, there are savings out there to be had. Right. Definitely. Definitely. You have to look at, and that's, you know, we're looking for months ahead. So uh, it looks fairly stable. So we're, that's good. And that's good for, for our customers. You know, that Amazon brings up an interesting point. I'm thinking about getting an Amazon package when you see, you know, they'll be advertising for other, you know, things that they do on the packaging, kind of innovating in that space. Um, I'm just wondering, you've been in, in this business a long time. You, you specialized in it. So you, you know so much about packaging. I'm just wondering, how has how has it changed over time? Like, what is how has packaging evolved? What's the biggest some of the biggest transitions you've seen over the past um, decade or decades um, up until today? What's what's kind of the some of the big uh, evolutions there? I, I think well, sustainability has helped driven you know a thought about packaging for for years and years people never thought about packaging never thought about how their product got there to the to the store and i think as as things have grown from big box stores to e-commerce people are seeing products damaged when they land at their front door so packaging is becoming more and more important and with that the engineering of it has become more important also brands like apple you know it, it's become more of an experience um, a lot of my time was spent in private label at Kmart developing that. And that was kind of an evolution back then when it was just in the forefront of changing from your black and white packaging to actual creating a brand at a, at a retailer. Um, so we've seen that it's gotten into sustainability. Now we're in, you know, it's got to look great. Even you can buy a, you know, a $15 phone case and it's, in phenomenal packaging it's really because of the customers demanding they want really cool really neat stuff but then now you're getting the the environmental side of it the the sustainability and also it's being driven by amazon you know on the e-commerce they have their sioc the ships in its own container or frustration free they call it so they're trying to get minimal packaging but still protect the product so it's great for people like me it keeps us in business and it keeps things changing so the packaging world is always exciting. It is very exciting. Um, in fact, we've been binge watching my family and I Shark Tank over the summer. Uh, it's just a great show. It's clean. I got kids, and it's uh, innovative. And there's a lot of heartwarming stories. And uh, and I know not all deals come to fruition even after the show. But I will say one of the things that the sharks often point to is the packaging. And your packaging's wrong, or this packaging really does a good job telling the brand story because that's what grabs the customer and brings them in. And so the packaging is that first impression, right? It's that first thing that hits the consumer's eyes when they're looking at a product. Um, and so let me ask you this, though. There's a time, and I don't, I don't have the most up-to-date information on this, Mark, but I know you will. There was a time the Chinese were banning the, the recycled product coming in, recycled paper coming in. Uh, into their country, uh, and that was driving up prices and making it actually more difficult to achieve some of the sustainability goals that we've been discussing. Is that still in place? What's the current lay of the land in, in China, maybe some of the other Asian nations we produce footwear and packaging in as it relates to the importation of recycled material? Correct. Yeah. The, the OCC, they call it, Old Corrugate Container, was banned uh, a couple of years ago, and they had tapered off for about two or three years they let uh, only specific amount of tons of OCC in. 
And there's different grades of OCC, um, sorted, double sorted, just to make sure they eliminate some things uh, in there uh, because everyone throws everything in a box that gets recycled. Um, so yeah, that ban was in place. What, what's happened is China has helped packaging companies locally, manufacturers there, open up new mills and recycled mills locally. Uh, so they're doing a lot of that there. So prices did go up because of that, but they've also, there's some Chinese mills that have opened up facilities here in the States and elsewhere that are able to bring in their own, uh, it's not OCC, but it's a different form. So of, of the pulp type thing. So pulp is different than OCC. Um, so you could bring the pulp in, not the OCC, because the old OCC is basically pallets of boxes. And then they throw it in basically a, a giant blender. You got a big Vitamix over there that uh, could swallow, I think, a, a VW. And uh, they just throw everything. And that's how recycled paper is made. Um, so it's a pretty interesting process. But Is there anything else um, anywhere in the world, you know, EU, US, or uh, another potential disruptor on the horizon or right now, something that companies should be aware of when it comes to packaging? I think some of the the unfinished or la laws that are in, in process that haven't been completed yet. There's a lot of talk in different regions, different states even in the, in the U.S. of banning certain things. Um, one is, is PFAS. You know, of course, that's a, a horrible forever chemical. But what they've traced that back to are re registry receipts. So there's some in there when it gets heated and ground up for recycling in, in uh, paper making, that comes out. So, you know, is that going to be banned? And then how are we going to have to trace that and test it and make sure that our paper doesn't have it? So different laws are popping up everywhere uh, for environmental. And it's hard to grasp because there's so many of them. EU has a whole... You know, they're ahead of the U.S. They have a whole different set of laws. Here we have, you know, different things going on. So until they really play out, they're still a, you know, year, two, three years away before they're final. But uh, that's hard to navigate. That, that's a challenge to navigate. So I think that's some of the big disruptors. I think right now, some of the things we've seen are after COVID, some of the paper grades have been reduced. So where you had, I mentioned before, you had a different paper grade for anything you wanted. Now we're getting down to it's that's not being supplied anymore. And some of it's because of the OCC they can't get or, you know, the correct white for a white top liner they can't get. So they're trying to simplify that, you know, create some economies of scale that way instead of making smaller runs. This is all super fascinating, Mark. I could I, I can't believe I'm about to say this. I could talk packaging with you all day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we have to run. What's the best way for folks to get a hold of you or the Bill Rude team uh, if they listen to this and they want more information? They, they can get me on my email, um, mark, mark.maxwell at billarude.com or check our website out, Manage Packaging. Our division is Manage Packaging, Bill Rude at Manage Packaging. And uh, anyone, we'd be glad to talk to anybody and just even, you know, hopefully in Portland, our, our main U.S. office is in Portland. So grab a beer out there and we can, we can hash pa packaging over a, a beverage or two. Yeah, that sounds fun. So yeah. Mark will be about out with us for several events in Portland on September 19th, the sustainability event, and then our logistics supply chain event on September 20th with a bruise and shoes uh, as the, as the pivot point for both those events, the evening of the 19th, Mark, thank you for coming on shoe and show and opening our eyes to all the different latest innovations that are happening in the packaging world. We really appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Thanks for the partnership. Have a great, great day. Yeah, no problem, folks. This has been another exciting edition of Shoe and Show. You know, we talked a lot about packaging, pricing. You heard Mark even talk about PFAS. If you go, if you're an FDRA member and you go into our Intel Center, you'll find costing information on global packaging prices and pulp prices. Uh, we have a policy insight reports portal that has a number, a whole slew of policy insight reports that will get you up to speed on some of these complex issues in five or 10 minutes. We have a PFAS one. We have a regulatory sustainability, regulatory kind of landscape one across the European marketplace in particular. So if you're an FDRA member, hit up the Intel Center today for that information. If you're not, 
shoot us an email at info at FDRA.org and we'll give you all the information you need to be a part of this 80 year old amazing association. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't do it without you. So we appreciate your support. Thanks for listening. Check us out next week as another exciting edition hits. Make sure you subscribe, share this with your colleagues across your company, with your family and friends, because uh, we're just covering all, as it says, the ins and outs of all footwear. So thanks for joining us. And until next time, Shoe and Show is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.